This case is decided in 2019, March 06, jurisdiction based on the payment of docket fees. GR 2050 68, heirs of Renato Dragon, represented by Patricia Angeli Nubla, petitioner, and Manila Banking Corporation. This is a petition for review in certiorari sailing the June 27, 2012 decision and December 5, 2012. Facts of the case, from 1976 to 1982, Dragon obtained several loans from Manila Banking, which were evidenced by four promissory notes. One promissory note, number 2669, dated March 30, 1996, 1976. Another, March 30, 1976, and June 28, 1979, and finally, February 26, 1982. The total principal amount of his loans was 6,945,642. Its promissory note stipulated a rate of interest, penalty interest in case of default, and attorney's fees and due dates from 1976 to 1983. In 1987, Manila Banking was placed under receivership by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. The bank's receiver sent Dragon several demand letters requiring him to pay his outstanding loans, the final letter being dated August 12, 1988. In a statement of account attached to the final letter, Manila Banking computed the amount Dragon owed as 44,038,000. 995 pesos, consisting of the principal amount of 6,945,642, plus accrued interest, penalties, and attorney's fees as of July 31, 1998. Dragon failed to pay his outstanding obligation that on January 7, 1999, Manila Banking filed before the Regional Trial Court a complaint for collection of sum of money. The prayer of the complaint read, Wherefore, premises considered, it is most respectfully prayed that after hearing, judgment be rendered, ordering the defendant to pay plaintiff the above principal sum of 6,945,642 plus interest, penalties, and attorney's fees computed up to the date of actual payment pursuant to the corresponding promissory notes. Plaintiff further prays for such other reliefs and remedies as may be deemed just and equitable in the premises. In his answer with compulsory counterclaim, Dragon claimed that he had already partially paid his debts to Manila Banking and that his loans with the bank had been extinguished by novation. Allegedly, in 1984, Wood Industries Corporation, also Wood, of which he was an officer and a stockholder, wrote to Manila Banking requesting that Wood's loans and the accounts of other persons, including that of Dragon's, be reconstructed. Manila Banking allegedly agreed to the restructuring, allowing Khalilid Wood to assume Dragon's loan obligations, including those covered by the four promissory notes. Supposedly, this novation was confirmed in an April 22, 1991 decision of the Regional Trial Court. Branch 58 of Makati City in Civil Case Number 46961, titled The Manila Banking Corporation versus Builders Wood Products Incorporated, Claudio J. Sanchez, which had become final and executory. Dragon further claimed that Manila Banking's cause of action had prescribed since it failed to demand payment on the promissory notes within 10 years from their due date. He alleged that he never received the demand letter sent by Manila Banking, which would have otherwise interrupted the prescriptive period. He prayed that he be awarded $2 million as moral damages for Manila Banking's act of dispossessing him of his properties for the settlement of accounts that could not be established, which allegedly cost him emotional trauma. On September 26, 2007, the Regional Trial Court issued its decision in favor of Manila Banking. The dispositive portion of the decision read, Wherefore, plaintiff, having proved its claim by preponderance of evidence against defendant Renato P. Dragon, judgment is hereby rendered ordering defendant to pay plaintiff the following. The amount of 
6,945,642 pesos plus interest and penalties, the rates of which are indicated in the preceding paragraph starting August 12, 1998 until the obligation is fully paid. Attorney's fee is equivalent to 5% of the total amount due and the costs of the suit so ordered. The regional trial court noted that Dragon's defenses of prescription and novation were neither pleaded in his answer nor raised in a motion to dismiss. Even if it could have taken cognizance of these defenses, the regional trial court found that Manila Banking's cause of action had not prescribed and that the obligations were not novated. It held that Manila Banking's cause of action began to accrue only on August 12, 1998, when Dragon refused to pay and not on the maturity date stated in the promissory notes. Further, the regional trial court found that Dragon could not prove that the obligations had been novated. It ruled that the April 22, 1991 decisions of the regional trial court in civil case 46961 could not be proof of the alleged novation since the facts and subject matter of the case were different from his case. Nonetheless, the regional trial court held that it could only order Dragon to pay the amount of 6,945,642, representing his principal obligation plus the interest and penalty charges as stipulated in the promissory note and not 48,028,268 in 98. Per the statement of accounts submitted by Manila Banking, during the trial, Manila Banking failed to submit documents to justify or support the computation in the Statement of Accounts. Both parties filed motion for reconsideration of the regional trial called September 26, 2007 decision. Notably, in his reply and supplemental opposition to Manila Banking's motion for partial reconsideration, Dragon raised for the first time the issue of the trial court's lack of jurisdiction over the complaint. He alleged that Manila Banking willfully and deliberately evaded payment of the correct docket fees for the amount it claimed. In its April 3, 2008 order, the regional trial court denied both parties' motions. As to the issue of docket fees, it held that this court's ruling in Sun Insurance Office Limited v. Assumption applied. Hence, there was no need to resolve it. Upon appeal by both parties, the Court of Appeals in its June 27, 2012 decision affirmed the Regional Trial Court's September 26, 2007 decision in April 2008 order. As to Manila Banking, the Court of Appeals affirmed the Trial Court's finding that since the statement of account was not substantiated, the amount to be considered should only be 6,945,642 pesos plus the stipulated interest and penalty charges. As to Dragon, the Court of Appeals held that he proved neither innovation nor prescription. By failing to raise these defenses in his answer and before the termination of pre-trial, Dragon waived them in accordance with Rule 9, Section 1 of the Rules of Court. Moreover, the Court of Appeals found that the correspondence between Manila Banking and Khalilid Wood could not serve as basis for Dragon's claim of novation. Manila Banking's reply to Khalilid Wood's request to restructure the loans did not expressly state that Dragon had been released from his obligations under the promissory notes or that there was an agreement that Khalilid Wood would assume Dragon's obligations under the promissory notes. Since novation is never presumed but must be shown through an express agreement or by the party's interest, the Court of Appeals held that Dragon failed to prove that Novation had extinguished his obligations to Manila Banking. Similarly, the Court of Appeals ruled that the April 22, 1991 decision of the Regional Trial Court in Civil Case 46961 could not serve as the law of the case for this case. That decision it held never mentioned or alluded to the promissory notes for which Manila Banking was now demanding payment. The transaction in that case involved a different transaction that Khalilid Wood and Dragon had entered into. Dragon's defense of prescription was likewise not given credence by the Court of Appeals. It found that 
the 10-year prescriptive period on the enforcement of the promissory notes, which matured from 1982 to 1983, was interrupted by Manila Banking's demand letters to Dragon in November 1988, October 1991, February 1993, November 1994, January 1996, and August 1998. It did not give credence to Dragon's claim that he never received the demand letters, as he admitted in his answer that they had been sent to him. Dragon also failed to specifically deny Manila Banking's allegation that he received the demand letters. In its December 5, 2012 resolution, the Court of Appeals denied both parties' motions for reconsideration. In addition to its earlier ruling, the CA found that the deficient payment of docket fees did not automatically result in the case dismissal as the trial court may still allow payment of the difference within a reasonable period but before the expiry of the regulatory period. The deficiency could also be a lien on the judgment award. It ruled that the claimed interest, penalties, and attorney's fees could not be determined with certainty until the resolution of the case. On January 22, 2013, the heirs of Dragon, represented by Patricia Angeli, the Nubia heirs of Dragon, filed before this court a notice of death with motion for a substitution of petitioner and a motion for extension of time to file petition for review under Rule 45. The heirs of Dragon stated that Dragon died on October 22, 2012, and under Rule 3, Section 16 of the Rules of Court, his counsel informed this court of this fact and moved for the substitution of parties. They further prayed for an additional 30 days within which to file their petition for review. In its February 18, 2013 resolution, this court granted the motion for substitution and motion for extension of time. On February 22 or 1, 2013, the heirs of Dragon filed their petition for review on certiorari assailing the June 27, 2012 decision and December 5, 2012 resolution of the Court of Appeals. Petitioners argued that the regional trial court had no jurisdiction to award Manila Banking's claims due to insufficient payment of docket fees. Manila Banking only paid 34,975 pesos, corresponding to its 6,945,000 in its complaint. However, as shown by the statement of account attached to the complaint, the true amount it claimed was 44 million. Petitioners claimed that Manila Banking concealed the true amount it claimed to mislead the trial's court clerk of court and thus avoid paying the correct docket fees. For petitioners, Sun Insurance Office is inapplicable to this case. In Sun Insurance Office, the amount of damages could be inferred from the body of the complaint, and the plaintiff indicated willingness to abide by the rules by paying the additional fees when he amended his complaint, even without an order from the court. Here, Manila Banking knew the exact amount that it wanted to collect by way of interest, penalties and attorney's fees, yet it did not state these in its complaint's prayer. They argue that the applicable case is Takai versus Regional Trial Court of Tagum, Davao del Norte, where this court held that the phrase awards of claims not specified in the pleading should only refer to the damages arising after the filing of the complaint or similar pleading. Further, petitioners claim that the April 22, 1991 decision of the Regional Trial Court in Civil Case No. 46961 settled the novation of Dragon's obligation to Manila Banking. They point out that in the proceedings in Civil Case 46961, Dragon presented two letters dated November 14, 1984 and September 19, 1984, which the trial court found to be proof that Builders Wood Product Incorporated and Dragonus Guarantor were replaced by Kalilid Wood, the new debtor. Here, Dragon again offered these letters before the original trial court to prove that there was a consolidation of his loan accounts to Kalilid Wood's loan accounts. 
Petitioners argue that the Court of Appeals was incorrect in finding that April 22, 1991 decision of the Regional Trial Court in Civil Case Number 46961 did not cover the promissory notes. They claim that the promissory notes were part of the obligations that Khalilid would assumed when it proposed the loan reconstructing in 1984, even though they were not specifically stated in Civil Case Number 46961. For them, since the promissory notes all bore dates prior to 1984, they were necessarily included in the loan restructuring. Finally, petitioners argue that Manila Banking's cause of action had prescribed, claiming that Drago never admitted to receiving the demand letters allegedly sent by Manila Banking, which would have interrupted the prescriptive period. On April 3, 2013, this court ordered Manila Banking to comment on the petition. In its comment filed in, on June 10, 2013, respondent claims that the petition raises issues which constitute question of fact, namely, 1. Whether respondent paid the correct docket fees, 2. Whether innovation took place, 3. Whether its cause of action had prescribed. These issues, it averse, are improper in a Rule 45 petition, which only involves questions of law. Moreover, petitioners failed to prove that any of the exceptions which would allow this court to resolve a question of law or of fact exist. Respondent points out the issue raised in the petition were never raised during the pretrial in the regional trial court. For being belatedly raised, these defenses should be waived. In particular, Petitioners were stopped from questioning the non-payment of do correct docket fees since they only raised this issue after the Regional Trial Court rendered its September 26, 2007 decision against Dragon. Respondent further claims that it paid the correct amount of docket fees for the complaint based on the principal amount of 6945642 dollars it argues that it was impossible to compute the interest, penalties, and attorney's fees it should claim because the date of actual payment by Dragon was uncertain at the time of the filing of the complaint. However, even if the trial court rendered the judgment award more than the 6,945,642, it claimed respondent argued that Sun Insurance Office should apply and the additional docket fees shall be a lien on the judgment. Respondent further argues that 1. The April 22, 1991 decision of the Regional Trial Court in Civil Case Number 46961 was not the law of the case. Number 2. Petitioners failed to prove novation. Number 3. Dragon had failed to specifically deny receipt of Manila Banking demand letters. On July 31, 2013, this court required petitioners to file the reply to respondents' comment. In their reply, filed on October 29, 2013, petitioners argue that their petition raises questions of law cognizable by this court, namely whether the regional trial court had jurisdiction over Manila Banking's claim for interest, penalties, and attorney's fees despite its fra failure to pay the correct docket fees. Number two, whether the April 22, 1991 decision served as res judicata for this case. And number three, whether the prescriptive period begun to run only upon alleged service of the demand letter or upon maturity of the promissory notes. In its March 3, 2014 resolution, this court gave due course to the petition and required the parties to submit their memoranda. Respondent and petitioners filed their memoranda on May 8, 2014 and May 12, 2014, respectively. The issues to be resolved are First, whether or not the petition for review on certiorari raises questions of fact not cognizable under Rule 45 of the Rules of Court. And second, whether or not the trial court acquired jurisdiction over the complaint of respondents, the Manila Banking Corporation, in view of the insufficient payment of docket fees. The existence of novation and prescription of an action is a question of fact not cognizable under a petition for review on certiorari under 45 of the Rules of Court. To determine if there was novation, the facts on record must be examined to show if the elements are present. 
Here, the regional trial court and the Court of Appeals did not err in finding that there was no innovation of the promissory notes. Petitioners claim that Khalilid Wood had agreed to assume Dragon's personal loans to respondents, including those arising from the promissory note, an agreement given the judicial recognition in the April 22, 1991 decision of the regional trial court, based on the April 22, 1991, Builders Wood Products Incorporated obtained a loan from respondent with Dragon as surety in 1980. When Builders Wood Products Incorporated defaulted, respondent filed an action for sum of money against it and its sureties. In 1983, while the action was pending, Builders Wood Products Incorporated ceded its timber concession to Khalilid Wood, of which Dragon was an officer. Thus, Khalilid Wood assumed all the existing obligation of Builders Wood Products and later on the obligations of Dragon as part of its repayment schedule. The Court of Appeal is correct that the April 22, 1991 decision does not mention the promissory notes included in the loans Khalilid Wood had assumed from Dragon. What Khalilid Wood had assumed were Dragon's obligation as a surety for builders Wood products. It did not include his personal loans to respondents. Further, it is telling that petitioners cannot substantiate their claim that the promissory notes are included in the 1991 April 26 second decision. It declares that the proposed repayment plan by Khalilid regarding the various accounts mentioned in the letter, Exhibit 1, Dragon, that the letter dated September 19, 1984, including that of Builders and Dragon, were accepted by Plaintiff Manila Banking Corporation. Yet, petitioners were unable to prove or even claim that the promissory notes were included in these various accounts. These exhibits should have been easy to present as they should be extant judicial records, but they have not been presented by petitioners. Novation must be clear and unequivocal and is never presumed. It is the burden of the party asserting that novation has taken place to prove that all the elements exist. Likewise, the question of prescription of an action is a factual matter. The Court of Appeals did not err when it held that in addition, it cannot be said that appellant, appellant bank's cause of action based on such promissory notes had prescribed. Actions based upon a written contract should be brought within 10 years from the time the right of action accrues. Independently, such right of action accrue from the moment the breach of right or duty occurs. Prescription of action is then nevertheless interrupted when they are filed before the courts when there is a written extrajudicial demand by the creditors and when there is any written acknowledgement of the debt by the debtor. In the present case, the 10-year prescriptive period on the enforcement of said promissory notes that matured in 1982 to 1983 was timely interrupted by appellant's bank's demand letters to defendant appellant in November 1988, October 1991, in February 1993, in November 1994, January 1996, and August 1998. Verily, every time the defendant appellant receives said demand letters, a new 10-year period is added, and the elapsed period is thereby eliminated. Indeed, a written extrajudicial demand wipes out the period which has already elapsed, and it starts anew, the prescriptive period. The general rule is that the issue of jurisdiction may be raised at any stage of the proceedings, even on appeal, and is not lost by waiver or by estoppel. A party is only stopped from raising the issue when it does so in an unjustly belated manner, especially when it actively participated during trial. In Villa Gracia versus Fifth Sharia District Court. In Tijam versus Sibong Hanoi, it took Manila Surety and Fidelity Company 15 years before assailing the jurisdiction of the court first instance. As early as 1948, the Surety Company became a party to the case when it issued the counter bond to the rate of attachment. During trial, 
trial, it invoked the jurisdiction of the court at first instance by seeking several affirmative reliefs, including a motion to quash the writ of execution. The surety company only assailed the jurisdiction of the court of first instance in 1963 when the Court of Appeals affirmed the lower court's decision. This court said that we were to sanction such conduct on Manila Surety and Fidelity Company part. We would in effect be declaring as useless all the proceedings had in the present case since it was commenced on July 19, 1948 and compel the spouses to jump to go up their calvary once more. The inequality and unfairness of this is not only patent but revolting. After this court rendered the decision in Tijam, this court observed that the non-waivability of objection to jurisdiction has been ignored, and the Tijam doctrine has become more the general rule than the exception. In Kalimlim v. Ramirez, this court said that a rule that had been settled by unquestioned acceptance and upheld in decisions so numerous to cite is that the jurisdiction of a court over the subject matter of the action is a matter of law and may not be conferred by consent or agreement of the parties. The lack of jurisdiction of a court may be raised at any stage of the proceedings, even at appeal. This doctrine has been qualified by recent pronouncements which stemmed principally from the ruling in the cited cases of Tijam versus Sibong Hanoi. It is to be regretted, however, that the holding in said case had been applied to situations which were obviously not contemplated therein. Thus, the court reiterated the unquestionably accepted rule that objections to a court's jurisdiction over the subject matter may be raised at any stage of the proceedings, even on appeal. This is because jurisdiction over the subject matter is a matter of law and may not be conferred by consent or agreement of the parties. In Figueroa, this court ruled that the Tijam doctrine must be applied with great care. Otherwise, the doctrine may be a most effective weapon for the accomplishment of injustice. As topple being the nature of a forfeiture is not favored by law. It is to be applied rarely, only from necessity and only in extraordinary circumstances. The doctrine must be applied with great care and the equity must be strong in its favor. When misapplied, the doctrine of estoppel may be a most effective weapon for the accomplishment of injustice. A judgment rendered without jurisdiction over the subject matter is void. No latches will even attach when the judgment is null and void for want of jurisdiction. In this regard, this court has consistently held that a party may be stopped from questioning the lack of jurisdiction due to insufficient payment of filing of docket fees if the objection is not timely raised. The records show that Dragon raised the defense of prematurity and no other in this answer with compulsory counterclaim dated January 31, 2000. Dragon later actively participated in the proceedings of the case, including trial on the merits. Respondents' insufficient payment of docket fees was raised for the first time before the trial court in Dragon's reply to plaintiff opposition to defendant's motion for reconsideration and supplemental opposition to plaintiff motion for partial reconsideration filed on February 26, 2008, following the September 26, 2007 decision. The jurisdictional objection had been available to petitioners long before then, but they failed to timely raise it. Nonetheless, the circumstances of this case warrant an examination of the rules and principles on payment of docket fees. Under Rule 141, Section 1 of the Rules of Court, filing fees must be paid in full at the time an initiatory pleading or application is filed. Payment is indispensable for jurisdiction to vest in a court. The amount must be paid in full nonetheless. In Magaspi versus Remolete, despite insufficient payment of filing fees, a complaint for recovery of ownership and possession was deemed docketed as there had been an honest difference of opinion as to the correct amount to be paid. However, this court declined to apply Magaspi in Manchester Development Corporation versus Court of Appeals, 
There, the council deliberately did not specify the amount of damages in the complaint's prayer, even though at least $78 million was alleged in the body. It later even amended the same complaint to remove all mentions of damages in the body. Thus, the court cannot close this case without making the observation that it frowns at the practice of counsel who filed the original complaint in this case of omitting any specification of the amount of damages in the prayer, although the amount of over $78 million is alleged in the body of the complaint. This is clearly intended for no other purpose than to evade the payment of the correct docket fees or filing fees, if not to mislead the docket clerk in the assessment of the filing fee. This fraudulent practice was compounded when even at this court had taken cognizance of the anomaly and ordered an investigation, petitioner through another counsel filed an amendment complaint deleting all mention of the amount of damages being asked for in the body of the complaint. It was only when in obedience to the order of this court of October 18, 1985, the trial court directed that the amount of damages be specified in the amended complaint that petitioner's counsel wrote the damages sought in the much reduced amount of $10 million in the body of the complaint, but not in the prayer thereof. The design to avoid payment of the required docket fees is obvious. The court serves warning that it will take drastic action upon a repetition of this unethical practice. To put a stop to this irregularity henceforth, all complaints, petitions, answers, and other similar pleadings should specify the amount of damages being prayed for not only in the body of the pleading but also in the prayer and said damages shall be considered in the assessment of the filing fees in any case. Any pleading that fails to comply with this requirement shall not be accepted nor admitted, or shall otherwise be expunged from the record. The court acquires jurisdiction over any case only upon the payment of the prescribed docket fee. An amendment of the complaint or similar pleading will not thereby vest jurisdiction in the court much less the payment of the docket fee based on the amount sought in the amended pleading. The ruling in the Magaspi case, in so far as it is inconsistent with this pronouncement, is overturned and reversed. Later in Sun Insurance Office, this court laid down the rules concerning the payment of filing fees, taking into consideration Magaspi Manchester Development Corporation and other earlier rulings. Thus, the court rules as follows. It is not simply the filing of the complaint or appropriate initiatory pleading, but the payment of the prescribed docket fee that vests a trial court with jurisdiction over the subject matter or nature of the action. Where the filing of the initiatory pleading is not accompanied by payment of the docket fee, the court may allow payment of the fee within a reasonable time, but in no case beyond the applicable prescriptive or regulatory period. Number two, the same rule applies to permissive counterclaims, third-party claims, and similar pleadings, which shall not be considered filed until and unless the filing fee prescribed therefore is paid. The court may also allow payment of said fee within a reasonable time, but also in no case beyond its applicable prescriptive or regulatory period. Number three, where the trial court acquires jurisdiction over a claim by the filing of the appropriate pleading and payment of the prescribed filing fee, but subsequently the judgment awards a claim not specified in the pleading, or if specified, the same has been left for determination by the court, the additional filing fee, therefore, shall constitute a lien on the judgment. It shall be the responsibility of the clerk of court or his duly authorized deputy to enforce said lien and assess and collect the additional fee. Now, withstanding Sun Insurance Office, it must be emphasized that payment of filing fees in full at the time the initiatory pleading or application is filed is still the general rule. Exceptions that grant liberality for insufficient payment are strictly construed against the filing party. In Colorina v. Court of Appeals, while the payment of docket fees, like other procedural rules, may have been liberally construed in certain cases, if only to secure a just and speedy disposition of every action and proceeding, it should not be ignored or belittled lest it sketches 
and prejudices the other party's substantive rights. The payment of the jacket fee in the proper amount should be followed subject only to certain exceptions, which should be strictly construed. Moreover, the filing party must show that there was no intention to defraud the government of the inappropriate filing fee due it. In Manchester Development Corporation, this court found that the filing party, in repeatedly omitting the amount of damages it was asking for, aimed to evade payment of docket fees. The child court should have closely examined whether the circumstances here warrant the liberality of the Sun Insurance Office doctrine, especially when even a cursory application of the governing rules on docket fees at the time shows a glaring omission on respondent's part. For actions involving recovery of money or damages, the aggregate amount claimed should be the basis for assessment of docket fees. In Pakai, where the action is purely for the recovery of money or damages, the docket fees are assessed on the basis of the aggregate amount claimed, exclusive only of interest and costs. In this case, the complaint or similar pleading should, according to Circular Number 7 of this court, specify the amount of damages being prayed for not only in the body of the pleading but also in the prayer and said damages shall be considered in the assessment of the filing fees in any case. Two situations may arise. One is where the complaint or similar pleading sets out a claim purely for money or damages and there is no precise statement of the amounts being claimed. In this event, the rule is that the pleading will not be accepted nor admitted or shall otherwise be expunged from the record. In other words, the complaint or pleading may be dismissed or the claims as to which the amounts are unspecified may be expunged, although as aforesaid, stated, the court may on motion permit amendment of the complaint and payment of the fees provided the claim has not in the meantime become time barred. The other is where the pleading does specify the amount of every claim but the fees paid are insufficient and here again the rule now is that the court may allow a reasonable time for the payment of the prescribed fees or the balance thereof and upon such payment the defect is cured and the court may properly take cognizance of the action unless in the meantime prescription has set in and consequently barred the right of action. When respondent filed its complaint in 1999, the applicable rule on the basis of the assessment of docket fees was the Supreme Court Administrative Circular Number 1194 dated June 28, 1994, amending Rule 141 of the Rules of Court. Clearly, in this case, respondent is perfectly capable of estimating the accrual or accrued interest penalties and charges it demanded as of the date it filed its complaint. But despite respondent's demand letters containing computation of accrued interest penalties and attorney's fees, none of these computations were mentioned in the complaint, either in its body or prayer. This stands to stark contrast to Proton Filipinas Corporation versus Banque Nacional de Paris. There, the amount of uh, 1 million US dollars claimed by Banque Nacional de Paris for which it paid filing fees represented the principal amount in interest claim until August 15, 1998. The insufficient payment there pertained only to the unstated accrued interest from August 16, 1998 until September 7, 1998, the day the complaint was filed. Here, on the other hand, absolutely no filing fees were paid by the respondent for the accrued or accrued interest it claimed. In multiple pleadings, respondent reasoned that it has not defrauded the uh, government because the court may simply recoup the filing fees in the form of a lien over the judgment award in the event that it be awarded all the amounts it is allegedly owed. In its March 19, 2008 rejoinder to defendant reply dated 21 February 2008 with supplemental reply, number 8, following the Senate insurance ruling, any additional filing fees due to the award made by this honorable court when its proper determination of the interest penalties and attorney's fees that should rightfully be paid by defendant Dragon for putting plaintiff TMBC through all this trouble shall constitute a lien upon this honorable court's judgment. As such, the government will not be defrauded. Of the filing fees, do it, and defendant Dragon 
will not be spared from paying what he should rightfully be held liable for. In its October 23, 2009, Plaintiff Appealis Brief, number 20, following the Sun Insurance and Soriano and Padilla rulings, any additional filing fees due on the appeal decision upon the proper determination of the amount of interest, penalties, and attorney's fees that should rightfully be paid by defendant appellant Dragon to TMBC shall constitute a lien upon the judgment. As such, the government will not be defrauded of the filing fees to it, and defendant appellant Dragon will not be spared from paying what he should rightfully be held liable for. The same language appear in its June 10, 2013 comment and its May 8, 2014 memorandum. And Conceitedly, Rule 141, Section 2 of the Rules of Court states that fees in lien, where the court in its final judgment awards a claim not alleged or a relief different from or more than that claim in the pleading, the party concerned shall pay the additional fees which shall constitute a lien on the judgment in satisfaction of said lien. The clerk of court shall assess and collect the corresponding fees. However, the rule on after-judgment liens applies to instance of incorrectly assessed or paid filing fees or where the court has discretion to fix the amount to be awarded in Proton Filipinas Corporation. So that in Ayala Corporation versus Madayag, in interpreting the third rule laid down in San Insurance regarding awards of claim that's specified in the pleading, this court held that the same refers only to damages arising after the filing of the complaint or similar pleading as to which the additional filing fee, therefore, shall constitute a lien on the judgment. The amount of any claim for damages, therefore, arising on or before the filing of the complaint or any pleading should be specified. While it is true that the determination of certain damages as exemplary or corrective damages is left to the sound discretion of the court, it is the duty of the parties claiming such damages to specify the amount sought on the basis of which the court may make a proper determination and for the proper assessment of the appropriate docket fees. The exception contemplated as to claims not specified or to claims although specified are left for determination of the court is limited only to any damages that may arise after the filing of the complaint or similar pleading for them. It will not be possible for the claimant to specify nor speculate as to the amount thereof. Further, nowhere in any of the respondent's pleadings filed before any court did respondent manifest its willingness to the regional trial court or to the court of appeals or to this court that it will be paying additional docket fees when required. Its repeated invocation of Sun Insurance Office is not a manifestation of willingness to pay additional docket fees contemplated in United Overseas Bank and subsequent cases. In none of its pleadings did respondent allude to paying any additional docket fee is so ordered. Instead, it left to, it, to the courts to constitute a lien over a hypothetical award to which it was not entitled or both lower courts have already held. Unlike other cases, the amount of unremitted filing fees here is substantial. Respondent paid only 34975 0.75 in filing fees based on its 6,945,642 claim alleged in its count complaint. If respondent had properly stated the total sum it claimed in its prayer, including the interest, penalties, and charges, it should have paid 222,343 cents as computed by the clerk of court. In effect, Respondent only paid 15.7% of the docket fees it owes the court. Under the circumstances, a liberal application of the rules on payment of filing fee is unwarranted. In accordance with Manchester Development Corporation, the regional trial court did not acquire jurisdiction over the complaint due to respondents' insufficient payment of filing fees. Wherefore, the petition for review and certiorari is granted. The Court of Appeals' June 27, 2012 decision and December 5, 2012 decision are reversed and set aside.
the January 7, 1919 complaint filed by respondents, the Manila Banking Corporation before the Regional Trial Court is dismissed for a lack of jurisdiction due to non-payment of filing fees. It's ordered. Penned by Justice Leon N. Number 2, GR163361, March 12, 2014, Spouses Jose Estacion and Angelina Estacion versus Honorable Secretary, Department of Agrarian Reform, uh, Regional Director, DAR, Region 7, Provincial Agrarian Reform, Office of Negros Oriental. Facts of the case. In September 1995, Spouses Jose M. Estacion Jr. and Angelina T. Estacion Petitioners initially filed a petition for just compensation with the Regional Trial Court of Negros Oriental, Branch 30, acting as a Special Agrarian Court, or SAC. In their petition, they alleged that they are the owners of two parcels of adjacent land in Guihulngan, Negros Oriental, with an aggregate area of 900 86,932 square meters. The first parcel, lot number 1A, has 793,954 square meter, while the second parcel, lot number 4810, has 192,978 square meter, both covered by TCT number 1996. According to the petitioners, sometime in February 1974, they were informed that their properties were placed under the coverage of the Operation Land Transfer Program of Presidential Decree Number 27. They contested the coverage, claiming that it was untenanted and primarily devoted to crops other than rice and corn. Despite their protest, their properties were forcibly covered for agrarian purposes and that the tenants to whom the properties were awarded were enjoying the benefits thereof. Without the petitioners having been duly compensated for the value of said properties, thus the petitioner prayed for the determination of just compensation or in the alternative to restore to them possession of the properties with damages. Instead of filing an answer, Public Respondents Department of Agrarian Reform, or DAR, and Land Bank of the Philippines, LBP, filed a motion to dismiss, which, according to the petitioners, is a prohibited pleading under Section 16 of PD 946. In their motion to dismiss, Public Respondents claim that, one, the RTC has no jurisdiction over the case, number two, the petitioners have no legal personality to sue the public respondents. Number three, the petitioners have no cause of action against the public respondents. And number four, the case is barred by the statute of limitations, among others. The petitioners filed a comment on the motion to dismiss. On May 12, 1998, the petitioners filed an amended petition and included the Philippine National Bank, as respondents. It appears that sometime in October 1974, the petitioners mortgaged the properties covered by TCT number 1996 as security for uh, 449,200 loan they obtained from PNB. The mortgage was foreclosed on December 10, 1984, and title was already transferred to the name of PNB. In including PNB as respondent, the petitioner sent contented that its foreclosure of the mortgage properties was done in violation of PD number 27 and subsequently Republic Act number 6657, which prohibits the foreclosure of properties covered by the agrarian laws. PNB filed a motion to dismiss the amended petition alleging lack of cause of action and prescription. On July 23, 1999, the SAC, or Special Agrarian Court, issued an order dismissing the case for lack of jurisdiction and lack of cause of action. 
The SAC sustained PNB's claim that it has already acquired the rights over the property by virtue of the extrajudicial per foreclosure of the mortgage. The SAC also ruled that the petitioners failed to exhaust administrative remedies when they filed to secure prior determination of just compensation by the DAR. The SAC further ruled that being an SAC of limited jurisdiction, it does not have jurisdiction to nullify the extrajudicial foreclosure proceedings as indirectly sought by the petitioners. The dispositive portion of the SAC order reads, Accordingly, the order dated March 11, 1999 is modified and the above entitled case is dismissed for lack of jurisdiction and lack of cause of action. Petitioner's motion for reconsideration dated March 23, 1999 is denied for lack of merit to order. Thus, the petitioner appealed to the Court of Appeals which in the assailed decision dated September 26, 2003, dismissed the appeal for lack of merit. Their motion for reconsideration was denied by the CA in the assailed resolution dated March 22, 2004. Hence, this petition for review, where the petitioner argued that 1. Motions to dismiss filed by the respondents with the SAC are prohibited pleadings and should not have been given cognizance by the SAC. Number two, they are the absolute owners of the properties as evidenced by TCT number 1960 for lot 1A and tax declarations number 9002007 for lot number two issued in their names. And three, the SAC has jurisdiction to a determine just compensation and there is no need to pass to the DAR and B annul the sheriff's sale of the properties. The DAR filed a comment to the petition maintaining that the SAC correctly dismissed the case for lack of jurisdiction as it does not have any power to nullify the foreclosure order and that such issue was vested in the RTC in the exercise of its general jurisdiction. The DAR also argued that the petitioner do not have any personality to file the case since the properties have already been foreclosed by the PNB and the title was consolidated in its name. Finally, the DAR contended that the petitioners failed to exhaust their administrative remedies when they failed to seek initial de determination of just compensation with the DAR. PNB, meanwhile, justified the foreclosure of the property's mortgage by the petitioners. According to PNB, since the petitioners admitted that the properties were untenanted, PD number 27, which applies only to tenanted lands devoted to rice and corn, and which prohibits foreclosure of land covered by said act, does not apply. PNB also argued that it had every right to foreclose the mortgage on the properties due to the petitioner's failure to pay their agricultural crop loan, and that the latter's failure to redeem the properties justifies the consolidation of the title in PNB's name. Consequently, the petitioners are no longer owners of the properties and have no legal standing or cause of action to seek just compensation. PNB also maintained that the SAC does not have jurisdiction to nullify the foreclosure sale of the properties and that the period to file such action has already prescribed. Ruling of the Court The petition is, is denied for lack of merit. PD number 946 is not applicable. The basis of the petitioner's objection to the motions to dismiss filed by the respondents with the SAC is Section 17 of PD 946, which states, Number 17, pleadings, hearings, limitation, and postponements. The defendant shall file his answer to the complaint, not a motion to dismiss, within a non-extendable period of 10 days from service of summons, and the plaintiff shall file his answer to the counterclaim, if there be any, within a non-extendable period of 5 days. The petitioner's reliance on PD number 946, however, is misplaced. 
First, the petitioners are correct in pointing out that PD number 946 prohibits the filing of a motion to dismiss. PD number 946, however, is not applicable. It is settled that jurisdiction over the subject matter is determined by the law in force at the time of the commencement of the action. At the time the petitioner filed their case for just compensation in 1995, PD number 946, which reorganized the Court of Agrarian Relations, CAR, and streamlined its procedure, has already been superseded by RA 6657, which created, among others, the SACs. Section 57 of the RA 6657 expressly provides that the SAC shall exercise original and exclusive jurisdiction over all petitions for the determination of just compensation to landowners and the prosecution of all criminal offenses under said act. More importantly, Section 57 further provides that the rules of court shall apply to all proceedings before the SACs unless modified by this act. In this case, the RTC of Negros Oriental Branch 30 was acting as a SAC. The rules of court, therefore, was the rule of procedure applicable to the cases filed before it. Under Rule 16 of the Rules of Court, and even under present 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure as amended, a motion to dismiss is not a prohibited pleading. Consequently, the SAC had every right to admit and resolve the motions to dismiss filed by respondents LBP and BNB. Even assuming, for argument's sake, that PD number 946 is applicable, the rule prohibiting a motion to dismiss is not inflexible and admits of exception. The rule is that technicalities may be disregarded in order to resolve the case on its merits. It should be borne in mind that the prohibition on the filing of a motion to dismiss under PD 946 was meant to achieve a just, expeditious, and inexpensive disposition of Ligurian cases. In this case, the filing of the motion to dismiss did not unduly delay the disposition of the case. In fact, said motions brought into light the flaws in the appropriateness of the petition for just compensation filed by the petitioners and readily provided the SAC reasonable basis for its dismissal. In Tanpinko versus Intermediate Appellate Court, the court took exception to the literal interpretation of Section 17 of PD 946 and sustain the grant of a motion to dismiss. We therefore take exception to the literal application of Section 17 of PD 946 for as stated in Salonga v. Warner Barnes and Company, 88 Phil 125, an action is brought for a practical purpose nigh to obtain actual and positive relief. If the party sued upon is not the proper party, any decision that may be rendered against him would be futile, for it cannot be enforced or executed. The effort may be employed will be wasted. Moreover, Section 17 of PD number 946 explicitly required the car to utilize and employ every and all reasonable means to ascertain the facts of every case in accordance with justice and equity and the merits of the case without regard to technicalities of law and procedure. Certainly, it would be more dilatory if the SAC were to deny the motions to dismiss filed by the LBP and PNB, require them to file an answer and proceed with the trial of the case, only to subsequently dismiss the case based on the palpable grounds alleged in the motions to dismiss. It is not disputed that the subject lots were not redeemed from petitioner. When the one-year redemption period expired without private respondent exercising the right of redemption, ownership over the foreclosed properties was consolidated in the name of petitioner. Hence, the latter can legally transfer ownership therein to the DAR in compliance with Executive Order No. 407. Clearly, private respondent had no personality to sue for the determination and payment of just compensation of said lots because he failed to show that his offer was accepted by the DAR, and more importantly, because whatever right he may have had over said lots were defeated by the consolidation of ownership in the name of petitioner, 
who turned over the subject lots to Dar. Private respondent has no right to sell what never became his. Much more ask that he be compensated for that which was never bought from him. In upholding the Sachs dismissal of the case below, the CA sustained that the SAC's ruling that the petitioners failed to exhaust their administrative remedies when they filed the case for just compensation directly with the SAC instead of going through the door, summary administrative proceedings to determine compensation as provided in Section 16 of RA 6657. Contrary to the CS position, however, the RTC acting as SAC has jurisdiction to determine just compensation at the very first instance and the petitioners need not pass through the door for initial valuation. Section 57 of RA 6657 provides special jurisdiction. The special agrarian court shall have original and exclusive jurisdiction over all petitions for the determination of just compensation to landowners and the prosecution of all criminal offenses under this act. The rules of court shall apply to all proceedings before the special agrarian courts unless modified by this act. The special agrarian courts shall decide all appropriate cases under their special jurisdiction within 30 days from submission of the case for decision. The determination of just compensation is essentially a judicial function which is vested in the RTC acting as SAC. It cannot be lodged with administrative agencies such as the DAR. The court has already settled the rule that the SAC is not an appellate reviewer of the JAR decision in administrative cases involving compensation. In Land Bank of the Philippines v. Waikoko, the court upheld the jurisdiction of the SAC over the complaint for the determination of just compensation despite the absence of summary administrative proceedings before the DARAP. Meanwhile, in Land Bank of the Philippines v. Honeycomb Farm Corporation, the court ruled that the SAC properly acquired jurisdiction over the complaint for the determination of just compensation despite dependency of the DARA proceedings, according to the court. To reiterate, the taking of property under RA 6657 is an exercise of the state's power of eminent domain. The valuation of property or determination of just compensation in eminent domain proceedings is essentially a judicial function which is vested with the courts and not with administrative agencies, specifically when the parties cannot agree on the amount of just compensation, only the exercise of judicial power can settle the dispute with binding effect on the winning and losing parties. Nevertheless, as correctly pointed out by the SAC, it does not have the power to determine the validity of the extrajudicial foreclosure of the mortgage conducted by PNB over the properties as prayed for by the petitioners. The jurisdiction of the SAC vested by Section 57 of RA 6657, while original and exclusive, is limited only to petitions for the determination of just compensation to landowners and the prosecution of all criminal offenses under this Act. In Kismunda v. Court of Appeals, the court expressly ruled that Section 56 and 57 delimit the jurisdiction of the RTCs in agrarian cases only to these two instances. And as correctly ruled by the SAC, while uh, the SAC has powers inherent to the RTC under Section 56, number 3 of RA 6657, it should not be construed to refer to the power to exercise general jurisdiction which is vested in the RTC. Given this, it is no longer necessary to resolve respondent PNB's argument that the petitioner's cause of action for the declaration of the nullity of the extrajudicial foreclosure has already prescribed. Wherefore, the petition for review is denied for lack of merit, the decision dated September 26, 2003, and resolution dated March 22, 2004 of the Court of Appeals and CAGR number 65086 in so far as 
as it affirmed the order uh, dated July 23, 1999 of the Regional Trial Court of Negros Oriental, acting as special agrarian reward court, are affirmed.